the lungs, uh, lungs are in uh, the first attack, line of attack is in the lungs, both in the body of the Gaia, body of the water, body of the soil, body of the forest, and body of us and all other species. <clears throat> and fortunately now, if we were to adapt this, we have a lot of technologies about how to breathe from the navel. I am not recommending navel gazing, I am recommending navel breathing is a way to bring back that energy of light through the umbilical, then create the biome, biofield of each species. And that species remains on the household. Then that household is in the bioregion and that bio, those bioregions are within the biosphere and biosphere are within the galactic systems and all that. Now, <clears throat> like this turtle, how could we swim in this nested system? Could that be one of our reimagining culture uh, analogy or a picture for it? So anyway, this is what uh, Annapurna University yeah. wants to pro uh, propose that this could be one of the way to do it. Uh, next. <clears throat> Next, yes. <clears throat> so, uh, to again go to the diagnostic situation, in this crucible then, the option is upcycle and regenerate these waves of life systems, or downcycle and by default, we will degenerate. Excuse me, Pramod, just yeah. to tell you, you have about a minute and a half left. Oh, okay, perfect. So, world views based on Life is supreme rather than human is supreme. We need to change our eye view, world view, and world view. And uh, that is the best contribution that one of the uh, Jinan KB from India has contributed in this debate. <clears throat> so we can now think about regenerating waves of life through carbon, soil, water, climate waves, which I think Joe will show us right there in Barichara soil food health waves, wood wide waves, water shed, food shed, fiber shed, energy shed, and <clears throat> a work of Paul Hutton and many others have shown us that if we regenerate those waves of life, we can also draw down whatever is disrupting the climate. Next. Your time's almost over, Pramod. Uh, yes, sure. the, yeah, this will be the this will be the end of this part then. And one of the other proposals that I and the Annapurna University Collective is doing is in order to regenerate our culture at this point, due to such deep level of degree of disruptions, we need plurious species participating in the act of regeneration. We cannot do it alone. That that arrogance is no longer possible. It whatever happened in the last five hundred years, that arrogance will not take us anywhere. So we need to adapt, co-regenerating species, and for that, a little later, I have also used the word not autopoiesis but symbiosis. That is, we are going to co-generate, co-evolve together towards regeneration of multi-species, pluri-species assemblage. Uh, so uh, I want to now invite uh, Joe <coughs> to present his, uh, his case study and his ideas. Mm. Thank you very much, Pramod. I think this focus on being bio and ecocentric instead of anthropocentric is really fundamental. And what I'd love to start by um, saying is that I am located in the corner of the Great Turn, at least, of the Northern Andes in Colombia, where the Andes go sort of up uh, South America and then they make a sharp turn to the northeast, northwest to go toward Panama. And I'm in the village of Barichara. And what we're doing here is building a prototype for a bioregional scale economic system that incorporates a lot of the local indigenous knowledge with large scale ecological restoration and a movement to transform an extractive tourism industry as much as possible into a regenerative education model. 
And one of the pieces of this that feels really, really important is the embodiment of the ideas in practice, which is something like a mindfulness meditation done with movement, such as if you were doing dance therapy with your body. Here I'm thinking of dance therapy with landscapes. And I'm standing right now in our sanctuary food forest in a community reforestation project called Bioparque Mopora. And I just want to quickly show you what we've been doing here because this is a space that we've been working in since last June. So it's pretty new, it's less than a year old. And while there's some large trees that were planted 10 years ago, the part I really want to show you is how we've been digging these canals. I'll step over here so you can see this pattern. We're actually creating a river with a sequence of retention ponds in the shape of a serpent. And we're collaborating with a lot of natural forces the way the promoter was describing. So for example, we were pulling the invasive grass, which is called brachiaria, which is all that grass you see over in the distance. We're in the dry season and it hasn't rained in three months, which is why it's a little yellow and brown. But that grass is from Africa and it's so competitive that its roots um, suffocate and kill all the native plants. So what we did is we pulled that grass, turned it into compost and pulled all the dirt and soil out of its roots and made a layer of a really porous mulch. And what I want to show you here is all of these, this diversity of native bushes and shrubs that planted themselves in the wind. So all we did was created a porous substrate of soil, waited for the rain, and the wind brought the, the seeds. And here they are with three months without rain and they're still green because these are plants that evolved and adapted themselves to this tropical dry forest environment with extensive dry, dry periods every year. I just want to show you that so you can see that this way of collaborating with the rest of nature is really quite natural when we put ourselves into an embodied context in a specific piece of land. And so one of the pieces of my work that I think is extremely important is how to transform cultural trauma, which is related to the epidemic of disconnect that Promote was describing, uh, by using pro-social processes, which basically means ways of working with our internal emotions and our psychological coping mechanisms to be able to make visible our inner landscape so that we can start guide our, guiding ourselves more toward the living out of the values that we have and the things we care most about. But doing it within social contexts where we actually are learning together with other people who are doing the same thing. And this is maybe easier and more natural with humans, or at least it would seem to be, except you can do the same thing with the non-human world. So I can develop cooperative and co-creative relationships with soil, invasive grass, native seeds, and native bushes, <laughs> and with rain and water and with hydrology. And what's interesting is in some ways it's easier to practice with land than it is with other humans, because so many of us have built up psychological coping mechanisms to help us deal with stress and trauma from our childhoods that actually make us pretty bad at cooperating with each other. And so sometimes it's easier to cooperate with soil than it is to cooperate with other humans because we get in our own way. And so one of the things that's been really important to the work that, that we are doing is how do we build these psychological and social capacities to be able to co-create with other intelligent beings human or otherwise. And we're actually in the process of setting up an ecoversity here in Baricha, but this involves a really delicate process of decolonizing land and decolonizing mindsets of Campesino people who live here. Because even though I was born and raised in Missouri in the United States, and then lived in a lot of places, I'm not technically from here. In many ways, I behave more like an indigenous person than the descendants of the indigenous people of this territory because of how many people have internalized the liberal capitalism and its ideas of things like private land ownership, money as the exclusive form of wealth, material consumption as the measure of a successful and happy life, all of which is basically cultural fictions that are pathological. And so last year we did crowdfunding and raised money to buy a piece of land to set up a nature reserve and begin reforestation but we very carefully needed to work with the family that had ancestrally lived in the land 
and convince them that if they were going to accept our money to buy the land, they would also collaborate with us to regenerate it so we could eventually gift it to their grandchildren. And that was a six month long negotiation process to change the psychology of those people before we would buy the land from them. And so I just wanted to name some of these elements for our discussion today that a really important part of what I've discovered about landscape regeneration is how much of it is in the human ability to form relationships and why there's a really deep and primary focus in working on our own internal abilities to relate to ourselves, our personal histories, our cultural baggage, our landscapes, our larger economic systems, and that a lot of this is actually inner work. You could think of it as like ecological mindfulness work connected to landscape restoration. And I've discovered in my own world, while it's going through a lot of healing in the last few years, that it was only when I did the work in myself and in the land together that the magic would really begin to occur, which is that there are so many aspects of myself that are diminished because I never learned to relate to the 500 different kinds of beetles that live in this landscape or the dozens of different kinds of bees or the hundred different kinds of native trees. And as I form relationships with the intelligence and the unique life expressions of this broader ecology, I discover a richness of relationships into myself. So the inner work connected to the ecological work is something that I'm discovering to be truly transformational. So one other thing I just wanna share, and then I would like to pass it on to other panelists so we can have plenty of time for discussion afterwards is that we launched an online platform about two years ago called Earth Regenerators that has now grown, grown to 3,600 members. And our basic approach is to practice regenerative education around creating social supports for people to make changes in their lives, which begins with the foundation of forming friendships. And as we form friendships with each other while learning some of the psychological and social development processes to be better at being in relationships with each other, that we begin to find an abundance of ways to support each other in making life changes. And we're creating a regenerative finance system, a way of storing and sharing value of many different kinds expressed through these friendship relationships, which is why, why we're able to successfully do things like crowdfunding, uh, purchasing land, setting up educational processes, is because it's all grounded in rich, complex, and beautiful human relationships. So I'd like to stop there for now and then pass it to the next panelist, just to say that this focus on relationality, landscape connection, and internal work on cultural healing of traumas and historical challenges is where most of the regenerative work needs to be done. And the way that it gets expressed is in the flourishing of biodiversity and ecological health of our surroundings. So with that, Promote, I'll pass it back to you to pass it on to the next panelist. Thank you so much, Joe. This is, yeah, I'm a bit excited. So I'll give it on to Eddie. I'll, you, you have about 12 minutes, but because Joe didn't take up all of his time, if you need a little bit more, I'll just let you know, yeah, when you're when it's 12 minutes. So Eddie, te toca a ti. Yeah, it's okay. Thank you. I am with the baby, so <laughs> we can do it together. So I am Eddie. I am from Oaxaca, Mexico. Uh, I am part of an autonomous cooperative, and we produce craft chocolate. So... Uh, I just want to share a little bit about the experience with the cooperative and how we are thinking about regeneration and, and, and alternatives, creating alternatives. So um, we started the project nine years ago. We, did, we didn't know how to make chocolate. We didn't know how to decolonize ourselves or create something different. So we start like just doing it. And uh, we have a, a very important critic for formal education or the conventional educational system, because we, we, we believe that uh, conventional educational system creates a kind of inequality. So people who doesn't uh, go to school feel feels that they don't know anything. So we wanted to, to break with that and we start making uh, a thing all together. So, um, and the idea of the cooperative is, is a struggle for food sovereignty 
through the elaboration of craft chocolate. So we work with small farmers that they produce uh, cacao beans and other ingredients that we use for our chocolate. And we also, we think that it's not enough to produce a high quality chocolate, uh, that in the process we need to change the, the social relations of exploitation that this, this system has created. No? So uh, when we are working in cacao, we are not just making chocolate, we are trying to change the relations of hierarchy or exploitation or inequality that the system has internalized on us. So we are trying to transform that in horizontality, mutual support, solidarity, autonomy. So the way that we are doing that is inspired in the wisdom of our indigenous communities. I am from an indigenous community that is called Zapoteca, which is 10 hours from the capital of Oaxaca. So um, I started on schooling myself uh, 10 years ago. I am a sociologist. I went to the university to study sociology, but 10 years ago, I started a journey of unschooling myself. So I start uh, learning from my grandmother and my, my grandfather and the elders of my community how to, to, to live in, in harmony with nature and in harmony with other uh, human beings. So right now, uh, there, we have a network of at least 30 families that produces different kinds of ingredients that we use for chocolate. And not, not only uh, cacao, other cooperatives and other partners that are also creating other relationships. And we are also relating with some people in Japan, in Italy, in Europe. So the idea is trying to, um, yeah, we believe that this system is um, attacked to us from different levels, no? So we need to liberate ourselves from different levels also. So one of, well, our, our path is with food and with cacao and chocolate, but also with education, uh, with health. Um, so um, this is the idea of the co-op, no? And we are weaving uh, networks with other partners. So we are always trying to learn from other partners also. And um, we, we like this metaphor of cacao as a very good example of regeneration, no? Uh, cacao is a plant that when you are going to plant cacao, uh, you need to plant other trees. You, you cannot only plant cacao. No? So we, we believe that in, in this uh, new world that we want to create, um, we can uh, emulate that wisdom of cacao, uh, the agroforestry systems of cacao, but in community. No? And also we like to, to say that we need to destroy the idea of the individual. No? that the capitalism and also patriarchy has created on us, that we are individuals, that we are alone in the world. And we want to destroy that idea and trying to think ourselves as community and a weave of uh, social relationships and also natural relationships. So um, this is at least uh, a little bit of what we are doing here in Oaxaca. Uh, I would love to talk more with people who is here some of them uh, I'm meeting for, for the first time, but other are old friends. So I would love to talk with, with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Eddie. Good. So I'll pass it on to Thais, then I'll pass it on to Pramod, and then I think we can start a really interesting conversation. So Thais, if you're ready, I'll give you, yeah, yeah, 10, 10, 12 or 15 minutes. Yeah. Hi. Okay, perfect. I'll time myself so I, I'm not over. So I'm very happy to meet you all. Thank you very much for the space and for holding such a lovely space of openness for us to uh, have a, an open dialogue. Um, my name is Thais. I am from Brazil. I'm currently working on a project I co-founded called Eco University. So in Portuguese, Eco Universidade which is much inspired in Manish's work and ecoversities all around the world as well. So basically, I, I believe um, I um, feel as the same as the other panelists were speaking. And I think we are, we're, we're moving on of what Joe said from an anthropocentric worldview into an ecocentric worldview. And this is a very fundamental change. So what we see out there in the modern world in modernity 
is much of um, much being spoken by about sustainability and much being spoken by how can we maintain the current life we have but just by making small changes to sustain the current development and the current way of life but what we're speaking here when we when we speak of regeneration and what we speak of regenerative cultures we're, we're saying that we need to dig deeper we need to rethink the way we inhabit this earth to understand if this is the path that we want to be taking together as this earth community uh, that we are part of so it's not uh, the the worldview we, we we're speaking here about is not as nature is our place where we we take stuff in order to create more products or in order to serve humanity but in a sense of understanding our place within the ecosystem within different types of ecosystems with different different landscapes understanding how other beings have been co-creating uh, conditions for life for much more time even than we have been in existence in this earth and how can this intelligence be one of co-creation where we have equal standing values and i believe there are many types of cultures and and people within the land that already live in this way so i'm speaking in brazil from a stolen territory from this indigenous people so brazil was a territory that the, the whole of the country was inhabited by forests, by animals, by fungi, by many different types of cultures that we call indigenous Brazilian people, but they are diverse within themselves. And I stand in this land that has been corrupted and um, taken, everything has been taken from within this idea of modernity, within this idea of globalization, within this idea of development. So I believe that we, we create the future and the reality we're in. And we have been doing so within this um, domesticated way. So we're not conscious enough of what we're doing and what impact is causing. And we're not connected enough with the whole of life. We have excluded ourselves from every other being. So we don't know how to relate to trees anymore. We are, if we want to, we have to um, come back to maybe ancestral memory of how to do it and have the openness of heart of really understanding that there is a way of connecting that is more than this rational and um, scientific way we are accustomed by this overarching worldview that has dominated the world through colonialism and other practices. So understanding that we are disconnected from this whole, we've been domesticated by um, education, its sense, and um, modernity and the market and the way we, we understand of this globalized economy. When we take a step back, we enter a process of unlearning that Eddie was saying. So we are unlearning lots of things that we have learned that was supposed to be what we understand is reality. So when we, we uh, understand that there is another possibility of inhabiting this earth, which is not the only story that has been told throughout life, there are other stories, but they're just not being told enough or maybe have been repressed or taken from their land or taken voice out of them. But there are still stories in the world that, um, that are regenerative, that call nature uh, as a collaboration. And when you think that even this uh, revolution, may we call it, is happening even within science, when we take James Lovelock with Gaia theory, for example, bringing this idea of this earth that we are in being an alive being, that for scientists, this wasn't something we considered just like a lifetime ago. So how do we understand that we live in a, in a, in a planet which is alive and we're part of it? And there are many other types of beings which are alive and they are creating conditions for life that have been created over years of evolution. And how have we become the species within the community that have been, which are pushing 
ourselves apart from everything that's happening uh, within the, the natural community, that we have forgotten how to be part and how to belong in our own world. And we are currently destroying ourselves. So when we understand this point that we're in, we can choose of course, there is pain and death and, and the process of regeneration is also the process of decomposing. So there are some things we are having to let go into coming into being in a new regenerative way of collaborating with nature, of having a diverse mindset, of understanding collaboration, of um, learning how to be in community, of how to communicate with other beings and everything that was spoken here. So I think when we when we come to this place, our urge is to create something new. And of course, it's, it's this new ancestral future because we, we have already been um, cultures that have been already connected to land and have amazing technologies around how to inhabit this earth in an ecological uh, inter in integrated way. So uh, when, when we move to projects like this one, I'm here, or Joe is as well, I'm here in, in a project called Terra Luminous, which is a, also a, a eco-community. And um, we, we kind of um, draw and, and dance and um, make expressions and gestures towards this regenerative future we want to build, right? But there is still the modernity um, system itself being replicated, let's suppose, blindly by people who have who are domesticated and haven't under, haven't had this type of experience within the world. So I would I would like to share maybe maybe if, if you let me share just this cartography. So it's kind of a, a metaphor to say this this um, I, I I want us to go beyond duality of bad and good. Um, I don't want us to, to, um, to put names on, on to what we are, what I'm proposing here. But the idea is to understand that we can go beyond the way we inhabit the earth, understanding that there are different ways, but there are also lots of composting that we have to do. This is basically what I would like to say. So I'm sharing this cartography, which is a metaphor. I hope you can all see. It's a screenshot that I took um, from this class that I'm taking on uh, decolonization. And this material is made in a collaboration uh, with indigenous people from Canada and Brazil in the project called Gesture Towards Decolonial Futures. So I'll share the link so you can have access to all the cartographies. They're free and open source for everyone to use in educational spaces, for example. So the idea here is that you have this person sat, sitting on a top on a mountain of shit. So something we're going to decompost here. And in the other side, there is a rainbow. So let us attend ourselves to the first image here. So there is this person sitting on this collective shit we have constructed together uh, through all the history of humanity, right? Understanding our history. But I'm looking somewhere else. I don't know what's happening. I'm just gazing anywhere else rather than this shit that is around me. Then once I see the shit, which is down here, I start kind of vomiting because it's so hard to see everything that's happening to the world, to see extinction, to see COVID that we caused on ourselves, to see climate change and to see people dying and, and ecosystems dying and us being paralyzed with all this hard truth of what, what, what we have become as a society. So we start puking and feeling really bad looking towards what's happening in this um, modernity that we created. Then we are, our, our idea is to maybe run away to some place and recreate something new, which is recreating this new space, a new way to inhabit this world. And this is something that we create a new possibility of showing that it is possible to create a new reality that we understand is is maybe a, a, a point or a step towards 
an ecocentric worldview. And then when you look back again, it's hard to understand or, or to maybe do the work, but this amount of shit of modernity that we've created, which is like this um, understanding of, of pain and, um, and not such a bright side of what we, we constructed until today, individualism, uh, capitalism, the cult of money and all these types of things which you understand doesn't take us anywhere. And I'm almost ending because I know it's my time's ending. So when we look at it, we feel sick again. But the idea here is to be, come to a place where we can compost this shit of modernity that we created by taking away separation. So this brick wall that separates the shit from the earth is the story of separation, this worldview that we are separate from nature, we're separate from each other, we, uh, the world is separate, my personal life, my inner work is separate than the work that I'm putting into the world, my physical work. So when we take off separation out of the picture, we're able to compost and to create new meaning for everything that we lived. And then this rainbow, which is the, for example, the new world or, or the new horizon that we're, we're looking towards is able to invade all of reality and to come into being and to be part of everything we are um, waking up to be. So I just wanted to share this cartography with you guys because I think it's, it's a metaphor for we, what we can create in the future in a sense of taking away the separation wall that it's in between society and the rest of other beings, composting the difficult shit that we created to our, for ourselves, which is there, and letting the rainbow and this new, new old ancient form of life invade places and people and our hearts. So thank you for this space and I'm happy um, to, to uh, the open dialogue that's been happening. Thank you a lot, Thais. I'll think I'll give it back to you, Pramod. And if sure. you want, yeah, take as long as you need and then yes. we'll start the conversation. Yeah. Yes, it feels like we are right. Um, <clears throat> ready, uh, let me go through a few slides which might resonate uh, with all wh what we already heard. Um, so could you could I have the next one? Uh, one of the ideas from Bandana Siva that could be very handy for reimagining re uh, our culture, regenerative culture is the idea of health for biome that we could think about the individual biome of all species or the more biospheric biome or even more solar system biome. But what I am finding is that we need to act at the cellular level. And I think all the four presentations that we, are, uh, we heard today are going to that level of cellular ch changing of the basically the uh, the stomach lining, the intestinal lining, I call it, uh, because the colonization of intestinal lining has happened and that also has per permeated into the mental framework and all that. <clears throat> so here then, uh, the energetic body, the physical body, the microbial body, and this is where I would like to introduce the idea of whether the autopoietic, the way the systems theorists were talking about so far and the South American friends are very attached to it because I think the Varela and you know, they are Chilean scientists who like it. But if we were to take this pluri-species collaborative regenerative culture, we might, the appropriate word might be symbiotic. That is all species co-evolving together because the reality is actually all, has always been like that, but the human said, no, I am an autopoietic being. Uh, so, uh, and this is proposed also by Dana Haraway, uh, Anna Singh, and Karen Barad from UC Santa Cruz. So you might, uh, so maybe Joe, you can comment a little later on whether this move might help us. Uh, next. <clears throat> Yes, uh, same way I would like us to uh, pay a little more attention to 
why the launch of the earth as well as the human body and everybody, every species long were at the frontal attack in this combined climate coronavirus disruption. Why the long? So far, the long was the least uh, mentioned or cared for uh, part of the body. Do you see why? Because we thought the heart was uh, better, brain was the most driving factor. But now I think it is the long and I think I already said, not only the human lung, every species lung, and the lungs of the soil, lungs of the water, lungs of the trees, lungs of the mushrooms, lungs of the salmon, we need to attend to that. Uh, next. <clears throat> so uh, I think we just heard from uh, uh, someone in the, uh, <clears throat> that, uh, that how to bring this, right? Uh, and Pamela Colorado, one of the very wise uh, women from uh, indigenous tribe of America, uh, gave us an uh, interesting story that everybody began to say, oh, we have lost the spirit, where is our hope, where is our energy, you know, we're all depressed. And the one of the oldest uh, <clears throat> elders said, no, the spirit has not left us or abandoned us. It is waiting for us to recapture, re-invite. So that's one thing I, I think we all need to know that it is only the human mind and the body and psyche which is detached. The spirit is there, the wind is there. I live in a 10 acre farm here. The wind is always there. The birds are always there. Sunlight is always there. The minerals are always there. So it is the reconnecting from that epidemic of disconnect. <clears throat> and now one of the ways, and we could put this as one of the discussion item, can food be one of those linkages of reconnecting, regenerating culture? Uh, so, and this is the last one. That is also why food could be the most effective gateway to needed transformations but it will be different than Marxism or even what Che Guevara thought or even the liberation theology thought. Through food, we could have a transformation that is not only deep, but also delicious. And we need that deep and delicious adjective to our revolutions and transformation if they are to be really regenerated. Uh, next. And this is one of the experiments that uh, I was involved. I was sort of the thought leader in Portland, Oregon, where these are the school children from fourth grade up to the eighth grade. We engage them in a soil to supper pedagogy where they would learn in the garden while creating a garden. And each child has a six by six feet garden of herself, the way she wanted to make it. And each grade classroom will have a larger uh, bed of, so they could plant all from soil to supper. <clears throat> and it is not only about what we eat, but food coming from where we eat. Uh, could we go back? Yes. How to prepare and eat it. And who is and not. So food could embody all aspects of this relationship, including the governance, including the relationality, including creating an economy and all that. So we could share our experience during the discussion on this topic, if, if you feel like. Uh, next. <clears throat> so this is my professorial hat putting, if there is a certain kind of transitional, you know, conceptual mapping, uh, I like a meta transition towards uh, regenerative culture, that the diagraphy is uh, uh, <clears throat> some people in Europe, Bruno Latour has proposed that there is something called diagraphy uh, that is a particular crust of the earth. The earth doesn't belong to us, we belong to the earth, right? And the guy is alive. From pursuing enlightenment to entanglement, embodiment and belonging, that might be all of us are reverberating. Maybe that, that, is, that is the world that we need to really begin to question this whole idea of enlightenment that took us to the separation. 
then from being, becoming, to belonging, to pluris, species assemblages, discourse to design, which I think uh, among us, uh, Joe has been so far ahead, I am just impressed. And from university, multiversity to pluriversities, where everyone can learn wherever, however, whatever, whenever is possible. And this kind of technology might be a blessing in disguise or it might be further alienating, we will have to see, but a possibility of learning wherever, whenever, however is possible. The feverish earth as the mother of all storage learn the alchemy of turning carbon into life, again comes back to the regenerative agriculture, not into the greenhouse gas because even now Al Gore is starting a sequestering carbon kind of regenerative farming in Tennessee, where he was, where he is from. So he got a four, 400 acre farm and he's now doing every inch of the soil, how much it sequesters that extra carbon dioxide. And for us then, rather than the cognitive, it probably is the emotional courage that would allow us, enable us and sustain us while we are involved in uh, regenerative culture. So one more slide and let's go to the discussion. Yes, on the learning garden, I have been one of the person who uh, started the idea of uh, having children learn in the garden, with the garden, their one garden, not somebody's garden. And we did some research about what kind of learning happens in that garden space. We found that they are engaged, there is an engagement, there is an enactment, that is a hand, body is involved. There is enablement, the heart is happy, embodiment, the life force, the visceral vigor, the umbilical, umbilicus area, and there is empowerment. So, uh, and there are at this point thousands and thousands of initiatives all over the world. People are beginning to see that this connect is very uh, unhappy state of being for themselves, for their family but then there is an overwhelming push from the mass market and commodities that is uh, everywhere is the case. But if a forum like this, the Ecoversities Forum and you know hundreds of people being here, le learning from each other, listening to each other, we can create that another reality of valuing this process as a life enhancing, life affirming. And uh, with that, I want to open uh, discussion. Uh, so for discussion, as I am also the <coughs> voluntary uh, uh, facilitator, I was wondering whether we could pick up something. Uh, and on this, I want to um, uh, defer to um, uh, Joe. Joe, do you think for this panel, what we heard so far, uh, maybe one item of discussion could be this pluri-species collaboration and symbiosis. Is that will that be fertile idea? The other one would be: uh, Can food be the gateway to these transformations that are not only deep but also delicious? Sorry, I am putting the word word on it, but however you want to see it, and any other question. Well, I want to start by uh, really resonating deeply and um, and just want to build upon what Thais said about composting and about standing on the giant pile of shit. Um, because one of the things that I'm sitting right next to now is a, a very powerful and very concrete example of decolonization. So I'm taking a colonizer grass that was brought from Africa so that cows from Spain could come to this deforested land and create a kind of agriculture. And by combining the grass with goat manure, I've been making these potting soils that are allowing me to regrow native trees. And I just wanted to show how the food is the colonizer material. It's feces from goats, which are not from this region, and grass that's from Africa that was brought to feed cows that are not from this region all for a colonizer model. And that by understanding how to uh, partner with 
a diversity of species. I'm actually bringing the otto tree, which is also the indigenous people of the Northern Andes call it Madre de Agua, the mother of water, because this tree helps bring water into the ground. And I just wanted to start with that example to really like just concretely embody what both you promote and what Thais were talking about. And I think one of the beautiful ways we could explore teamwork here is that something that Dana Meadows also said in the early 1980s after a lot of work was done with the limits to growth study is that the only way to create a sustainable planetary system for humans and avoid our extinction is to create a planetary network of local living economies organized as bioregions and in each bioregion create a bioregional learning center. So what Dais is demonstrating in Brazil, what we're doing here in Colombia, what it sounds like Eddie and his uh, network of cooperatives are doing beautifully in Oaxaca in Mexico, and the vision that promo that you have for Nepal and for the Himalayas with uh, the idea of a pluriversity. It feels like one of the most beautiful things we can do is very strongly express the local ecology and culture of our places as part of a multi-place strategy. To say that I have my place, you have your place, but every place has its place. And I'd love to just hear, maybe passing it forward to Thais next, what you think about this approach and how this kind of a dialogue we're having now might be helpful. Thank you, Joe. Well, I agree, because I, I believe that nature itself um, tells us and shows us that it is this decentralized um, intelligent organism. So when we talk about localization, for example, is one of the movements that, that consonates with this. So it's, it's similar to what we're speaking. It's the sense of um, falling in love with the land you're in. So sometimes you don't even want to travel anywhere else because there's so much beauty and, and um, learning and relationship from where you are. And when you fall in love with the place that you are, you see the diversity of potential that there is, that it's there. And here in Brazil, where I'm passionate about is this uh, type of um, ecosystem which I was born in, which is the Atlantic forest, which is different from the Amazon, which is different from the Cerrado or the Pantanal or so many different types of ecosystems that exist. The way of inhabiting the Atlantic forest must be very different than inhabiting the Himalayas. But you fall in love with place and you understand that difference is, is, is beauty. And, and you, every single space on earth has its own way of being and it's beautiful by itself. And it's, it, there's lots of learning into relating with, with the place. And I, I believe that the, the, toward, when we go towards regenerative cultures, we go towards respecting this diversity and this relationship to place and understanding that there will be different cultures within different landscapes within within this different relationships with their land and peop and the land will speak through the people so when we go to deep ecology and we speak to well he's not alive anymore but he's alive in my heart and his words well Arines, that he speaks a lot about deep ecology there he speaks the mountain speaks through him and his ecosystem is part of who he is so I, I truly uh, agree with you when we when we need bioregional e economies and ways of living and respecting where we are and even how to construct our houses and and the 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 understanding of culture and the history of that place and regenerating what what the colonial system and modernity did to that land and rewilding bringing the wildness back to our lives. And bringing the wildness back to our life is accepting the wild as the wild as it is, the way we were born. So to wild is to be born. So the idea is to go back to 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 the birth, to being connected, to being part of this this planet, to belonging. And this is this is why I, I think we should go local. We should respect how our locality works. We should know the different types of plants we can eat. Because I, I live in Brazil and I eat all this European vegetables. And there's so much that Brazilian food has to offer. So I also agree with Pramond when he says 
food can be deep revolution. We can start by localizing our food systems. And this is already, wow, <laughs> great change. So yeah, thank you for, for opening the space and showing your space, because I think you're living regeneration in, in an experiential, deep experience banner. And I, and I am truly inspired, Joe. So maybe uh, Eddie can tell us a bit about how it's happening. Yes, um, I, I was fortunate to um, visit your Atlantic forest in 2005. Uh, I was invited to participate in your Brazilian first conference, national conference on environmental justice. I was one of the keynote speakers and they took me around, including the Atlantic forest. Uh, amazing, you are right, uh, it's an amazing area. Uh, Eddie, could you give us, uh, share your views about the pluri-species collaboration? The cacao, the coca, the role of coca in regenerating culture, land, soil, economy, um, whatever you want to add, and then we want to open uh, it to all amazing participants, including Chuck, he's my friend. Hi, Chuck, and all of you, uh, wonderful to know you. So we want to hear from you, your comments, your contribution. So Eddie, we want to hear from you for a minute or so. Thank you, Brahmat. Yeah, I, I just want to point to things. Um, one is the, that I am very, very agree with that idea of that food can be the, the starting point of our re regeneration. Um, there is a poem from Eduardo Galeano that says that in these times who has not fear to eat, has fear to food, no? So it's a good example of how we have been colonized and how food, um, it's also a way of control of the population or the countries. So uh, we in the cooperative, we are trying to create an idea and a practice of food as a political act and also food as rebellion, no? Um, if, we, if we talk about um, uh, food as a social fabric, not only as a summary of uh, products or ingredients, uh, we can start thinking about uh, how um, uh, when we eat, we are, we are also choosing for, for a different uh, world, no? So it depending of the, of the food that we have or the relationships that we are building through this food, no? As Joe is showing to us, this is like the manifestation of all the things that we are talking here. And also I am here in the chocolate workshop. So you can see the grinder and we have here the machines and the chocolate. So uh, we think that chocolate can be a delicious way of changing the world. So it's, there are just examples, no? It's not that all of us needs to do the same. I think the diversity and all the, the options that we have, it's, it's um, depending of the circumstances and the context that, that we have, no? And the other thing is that I read in the chat, I don't remember, Aileen, maybe she wrote that this connection or the connection is not to, um, that we are still on time, no? So I am agree with that also, that um, it's not only about that everything is lost, I think is to talking about hope, no? Where, where, is, our ho where, where is our hope, no? And for us, um, the best example that we have in America, and I think all over the world, are the indigenous communities, because they have uh, been the guardians of this wisdom, of this knowledge, of this other way of living. In South America, uh, they talk about buen vivir, no? Or well, well living. And in Oaxaca, we talk about comunalidad or communality. So it's possible, it's possible to live in a different way uh, it's happening today, right now. So we only need to, to, to look at these experiences um, and be brave and start doing something, no? So for me, this is the one big uh, message that, that we can have from this conversation. Thank you. Gracias, Eddie. Uh, I was also fortunate to uh, visit your uh, Japotec Valley 
and we went to Chikahuasla, through the mountain area, through the valley uh, with uh, Gustavo Esteva. I, I had a chance to work with him for two and a half months all over, including going to Cuernavaca to see where Ivan Illich had his school in a, in a ranch, in a fianca, <clears throat> on and on. So very nice to um, hear from you. And I am wondering whether I visited your youth group, whether you were part of it. They were just begun to identify the piece of land outside Oaxaca. Uh, I don't know whether that is your group, but anyway, there, there, all those formations was happening uh, all over Mexico and Gustavo's inspirational. And I even met Japatistas coming through Oaxaca right that year. It was 2000, <laughs> 22 years ago. <clears throat> anyway, uh, so if uh, I could uh, propose that let's hear from all of you who are participating in this. Uh, I want to invite Chuck, if you are willing, uh, you are a senior person, you have so much experience on the economy, and Chuck and I are also uh, wanting to explore possibilities to work uh, in the southwest area of Virginia, one of the most uh, remote, so-called remote, and very fecund forest, the soil is still alive, you can swim on the water in the rivers there, <clears throat> so I met him in November and then again in uh, February, uh, this month, uh, uh, January, end of January. Uh, if you want to share anything, Chuck, uh, about your um, idea about how to make learning more alive uh, or anyone else, please contribute. And we are here and we have 15 minutes. Well, thank you, Pramod and, and all. Um, I really enjoyed uh, your perspectives. Uh, obviously, I don't know what to add to the real world perspectives. Um, other than perhaps um, the, well, when Pramod on your slide, you said that uh, this effort could be deep and delicious. <laughs> yeah. uh, it seemed like you were talking about food. Yes, uh, I'm thinking that it can also be about community. Yes. That, uh, as one of our friends David Abram says, our distractions are causing our destruction, and that if we were more focused locally on developing really vibrant oral cultures that were unique to the local community, uh, we would have a richer life. And um, it's not just the food, fiber, and fuel, but the uh, relational trust that can be built um, with authentic dialogue in a community. So, thank, you. thank you, Chuck. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yes, um, anyone, please. And that, uh, Joe, at the, we want to conclude this session with you showing us more of the garden, OK? So that will be the last three minutes. So be prepared for that. Yes. Well, I will go. Que lindo verte, Eddie. First of all, I have to salute. I was with him in Cacao <laughs> two, three years ago, right? I was hosted. There was no baby. And now it's a beautiful, growing family. I don't know Thais, but I'm also from Brazil. And I think you were talking about the course from Vanessa Andreotti, right? The slide you were showing us kind of, no, I mean, I related to many things you're all saying. I just wanted to express my gratitude for being here. It's pretty late here. It's, I'm, I'm in Europe now and it's midnight. Yesterday I was also over midnight. I love these um, late night dreams. So I thank you for feeding deliciously my sleep, which will be pretty soon. And yeah, I just want to say thank you to everybody and send greetings. Thanks, Joe, for being outside and giving us some uh, green space in the spring. I, and I had some chocolate, Eddie. I was eating some chocolate before the meeting. I said, my son was also with me with Eddie and we became chocolate lovers uh, but, uh, and we have to make a, a lot of 
campaigning here to express to people that we don't buy Milka and we don't buy so many labor, uh, Nestle and all this stuff. These are the my kids doing with their friends. Um, it's a hard work, you know, to be uh, in the consumer uh, mainstream society, having to re-educate our taste. Yeah. El saludos para las chicas que no están ahí contigo. Ah, Arely! Um, gratulaciones, qué lindos. Muy buen verte. ¿Y Jimenita, dónde está? Ah, está jugando por aquí. Ah, Pero muchas gracias, Daniela. Ah, saludos. Ah, ah, <ríe> no queríamos robar cámara. <ríe> Thank, uh, thank you, everybody. Ah, Jimenita, qué linda. Gratulaciones por tu hermanito. Gracias. Gracias. Sorry, a little bit of a family conversity, right? So it's nice to have some uh, love moments. <laughs> yes, that's the connection. That is, yes, chocolate, people, land <laughs> yes so um please anyone please jump in i just want to add how nice it is to see the children here um, um principle that we have here in Barichara, my friend felipe medina really embodies it beautifully is also promotes friend is that uh the children are the heart of our regenerative work and we cannot have any serious community discussion unless the children are playing in the middle of the circle of the adults, because we understand what we're doing this for. And we actually have a group. So, so we had an event on November 29th, which was called Fondo Semillas Tejiendo. So we're weaving um, seed funds of community and creating a space for creating a, a territorial foundation. And at one point, a six-year-old boy asked for the microphone and declared his dream to, to clean the Quebrada of Rio Barichara, which is about a 40,000 hectare drainage. And it's a dead river where quite literally there is more shit from the unprocessed water of the toilets in Barichara that falls over the waterfall than water from the river because it's been so badly destroyed. And a group of children between the age of six and eight said that they wanted to be able to fish there again. And then they promptly raised money from the community to begin a process. So the children were leading the way in cleaning the river. And for me, this embodies something very special about regenerative culture, which is the recognition that truth comes from whoever speaks it. And if it comes from the children, then it comes from the children. And this is something I think is very, very important is to recognize and honor the strength of speaking truth no matter where it comes from. Thank you so much, Joe. I just need to add, add this uh, storyline um, that somehow three years ago, four, three and a half years ago, Joe and I began to meet online like this. Then he, in about third meeting, he said, Pramod, I think you need to go to Barichara in Colombia, a person from the Himalayas and meet this young man, Felipe and his family. This is how, and I <clears throat> took his advice like a devout. <laughs> I actually went there. <laughs> and I was there one month and maybe a few more days. And uh, really so much at home on that landscape and culture. I probably gave our six, seven presentations presentations to teachers and municipal leaders and communities and NGOs and all this. But I did one dozen fiestas, including myself cooking with Himalayan spices, with barichara ingredients, including the cabrito. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I popularized the idea of cabrito, although you're right, it might not be the native uh, animal. <clears throat> then I Hope I plowed some bumpy road for you, Joe, <laughs> for, you, for you to go in because I I put so many fiestas and people just loved it. So I'm so glad and I hope to be back to back in Barichara very soon. 
And then I am also thinking that maybe we want to bring you to the Himalayas uh, to really talk about what is possible in a place like Colombia and Barichara. A very similar history, similar ecology <clears throat> between the Himalayas and what you have <coughs> in Colombia. Uh, so I just want to acknowledge um, your, you have taken that Barichara case study to such a depth of uh, kind of analysis, including the governance, including the economy, including even participating in perhaps a different kind of currency, life currency, rather than the dollar currency and all that. Uh, just to share with you that we are uh, kind of the co-conspirators on some of this, <laughs> some of this, but Joe uh, deserves our big salute, big thumbs up for, for his effort. And I hope your, your health, your family will thrive there and that we will actually have <clears throat> uh, a live ecoversity, pluriversity, whatever your name we want to give it, uh, there on that public land, which now uh, I remember talking about the kind of plants they need with the two uh, female leaders there. And they said, no, any tree will do the job. I said, no, sorry. <laughs> and you are doing exactly which to pull out, which to bring in, all that. And that <clears throat> that is my, the wording call, co-evolving, co-creating, co-regenerating with pluri species. It might be a earthworm, it might be a spider, it might be that particular tree in Colombia and we have 125 such water-friendly trees um, that our ancestors have always planted and all that. So, um, so we yeah. still have five, five minutes left. <clears throat> yeah, I think uh, Paramod, just for you to know, somebody wrote in the chat, yeah. if you could also help them in Africa with an issue an initiative they're starting. The person that wrote this is called KK Noru. I don't know, KK, if Noru, oh. if you want to come and say something, just for you to know, Pramod. Yes, could you um, could you email me and Joe? I will uh, give you my email here. Uh, sorry. And then I will share with Joe, yes, uh, between Joe and me, we could collect whatever the hundreds of people we, who know about, but I have heard a lot about the Sahel region being reforested. <clears throat> Paul Hawkins' book, Regeneration, documents that. So there might be already a lot of information, but we, we will love to do uh, whatever is possible. And uh, we are also thinking maybe the Ethiopian highlands, Kenya, Tanzania, Maasai areas, peasant areas are probably very good uh, places for something that is happening in Colombia, in Brazil, in Peru also. I know a lot of people in Peru and also in the Himalayas. Uh, Himalayas is, <clears throat> we are postponing for a few months because we want the municipalities to say, we like this idea, we want to host you rather than we going there as an NGO. So that modality, I'm trying to change it also. Not like an NGO with the money comes to the village. It's more like village invites us saying, we want to do this, can you help? So anyway, um, yes, we would like to do that. <clears throat> so if there is no one else, I would like to invite uh, my next to, uh, next to me, Jeffer, because she's also a food system student and a food regenerator. So you want to share oh, something? All right. Well, that's a surprise. <laughs> um, sure. Well, first off, that was just a really fantastic panel. So thank you to everyone who, who is speaking. It's really, really inspiring and heartening because you're touching upon and delving a lot more in depth um, the things that I'm already thinking about and trying to apply out where um, I'm normally based out of in Clifton, Arizona, it's about 5,200 feet elevation um, in the high desert mountains. And there's about 40 acres um, that some friends and I share out there where we want to build kind of a, a collaborative 
multi-species sanctuary of sorts um, and provide a place for people um, of various backgrounds and species to, um, you know, grow and like connect to the ecosystem, connect with their bodies, um, connect um, with each other. So I, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> and everybody is welcome. That, that's Everybody's welcome. Uh, almost Party like a, they want to create a sanctuary where when you are tired, frustrated, come there, eat well, rest well, and recuperate oh. and do something. And because right. a lot of us come from fairly like transient backgrounds, you know, having spent a lot of time homeless or hitchhiking or um, living in a sort of nomadic capacity in, in the U.S. trying to live outside of um, sort of these oppressive systems, but also in contact with them. Um, and so it, it's, it's in treating it as a temporary base for transient people um, around the country, you know, as a way to kind of get away from civilization, <laughs> but also stay connected to it. And thank you for that invitation. And her name is yeah. Jeffer. She uh, coming here, what, it has been two months. She <laughs> has introduced me to the beauty of pumpkin and squashes. <laughs> <laughs> and sweet potato, I had not tasted them like that before. And just roasting them, pure and simple. <laughs> Thank you for that. There's just such a new sweet potatoes and uh, the all kinds of squash and pumpkin have so much flavor, so much <laughs> nutrition, and they are everywhere. <clears throat> we can grow them everywhere and all that. So sure. uh, we have now can i say something before I, so, I, is there anyone else please yeah i is wanted it? to say something that i forgot before because thais was talking about composting shit and uh, our own shit and joey also about the kids i'm doing an exercise since a while here we have i'm an artist and we organize some community work in the city and we distributed 20 liters buckets to some people to start a garden so I don't know if you're familiar with Terra Preta, this indigenous uh, black earth. They use bio oh, yes. organisms. So we have distributed around here in our gallery to random people in the city who are interested to collect their own shit, put biochar, put microorganisms, and store their bucket for a year. And now this spring, we're gonna collect their shit back and we're gonna start a garden. It's a very small action, but I think it's a practical way of composting our own shit and start for yeah. people in the city to reconnect with the life cycle. And yeah. That, thank you for bringing that story. <laughs> uh, by In my other more slides, I have talked about it. And I was again fortunate <clears throat> to go to the land of Terra Preta and Terra Mulata. And if you are in Peru, I would recommend you go to uh, that area called Chachapoyas in the Amazonas, mm -hmm. where you could, in the villages, you could see the first three feet, two feet, like a terra preta, the blackest soil, and then it becomes terra mulata, then <laughs> no mulata, <laughs> then it becomes white. So um, I had opportunity to actually, in, uh, I have a friend there, who makes that the best possible terra preta by collecting from the forest floor first, then feeding them, intoxicating these bugs and earthworms and things with molasses and oh my goodness, so much food there. <laughs> and then, <clears throat> it, then you have to do it ritually through the indigenous, uh, have you heard about that? That you have to break the pottery to bring that more extra energy in Terra Preta. So that's another element that scientists might forget. Then they will- To break do. what? It's a kind of a shards of a pottery. Ah, yeah. They, 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 uh -huh, yeah, yeah. You have to break it on top of the pile of Terra Preta so it gets that extra energetic body, do you see? We put some, uh, we put some miner, uh, broken stone around it, like- uh, Well, the, uh, that's what you mean. How more than the stone, the broken pottery, because it has gone through that hot and cold. Yeah. 
So in the clean. So anyway, there is an amazing, yeah. if you want to know more, uh, there is an organization called Sachamama, uh, Google search, and they are teaching Canadian students globally. They come there, make the Tarapreta, <clears throat> and then we did experiment in the school garden. And where the Tarapreta was put in the soil, oh my goodness, in one month, there was already a harvest. And in the experimental plot where Terra Preta was not there, the plant could hardly stand up. So anyway, the students are learning all that. So anyway. Hey, um, um, yeah. My battery is almost dead on my phone and I'd love to show everyone something really quickly before it's too dark. Yeah. Yes. Which is we have a very special tree here called Seba Barigona, which only exists in Chicamocha Canyon and it's nearly extinct because those goats that are not from here are eating all of the baby trees. So we have a tree here that we named La Nieta Seba, the granddaughter tree, the granddaughter Seba. And this is one that we rescued. And it's just growing its first little buds. Let's see if I can get the angle right where you can see it. Right, well, I'm not getting to it. It is, see right here, it's just getting its buds. Right, there you go. And this is a tree that we rescued and transplanted about three and a half years old. I just wanted to, to name this ritual of protecting a nearly extinct tree and then giving it a dual name. La Nieta, the granddaughter, is meant to represent that we want this tree to have granddaughters and that I want my own granddaughter because my daughter is five years old. I want my own granddaughter to grow up in a world where this tree exists. So I just wanted to show that really quickly to say that we can create our own rituals to, to build significance around simple acts like putting a tree in the ground. And it bonds us to a place where I'll keep wanting to come back here with my daughter until she's an adult. And hopefully when she's an adult, she'll bring her children. And this multi-generational relationship to protecting nearly extinct species is a profound opportunity for creating a story of place. And I just wanted to share that because my bad was about to die. It's getting too dark to see anything. <laughs> yes. How wonderful this, uh, <clears throat> the will, right? The willpower, then the recognizing the ingredients more than just the human. Then they will begin to create their own dynamic. And that is very much uh, available to see in the, Barichara bio parque, right? <clears throat> bio parque, yes. Anything yes. else, uh, Joe? We will uh, conclude with your, however you want to do it. Um, well, I just wanted to show uh, if I can turn my camera around. Well, let me do that in Zoom or no? Yes, it won't. Um, oh, here we go. I can do it this way. So just wanted to walk everyone through part of this river that we're building so you can see how it, this is one of our retention ponds and how this is rainwater fed. So it'll only have water in it when it rains. But as I'm going upstream now into this bigger channel and then the bigger channel goes and the thing that's interesting about this is that we actually get the water from this deep ditch and I'm taking it back to the top. So you can see that we're actually collecting all of this from erosion that would come down on the dirt road. And so right up there is the beginning of an ancestral indigenous footpath. And they built a road, so now there's a lot of erosion. And we're collecting all the rainwater from that erosion, pulling it off the road to enter this system that will imitate a river during the time of heavy rain. And so I just wanted to share this briefly to say that the design of the water flow across land is the circulatory system of the landscape. And we're shaping it like a serpent. So there are all these channel and retention ponds that will absorb water into the ground and accelerate the growth of our fruit forest here. And I just wanted to show that briefly before it got too dark to say that we can actually co-create with water uh, to build systems of life. And that's something that we're doing here in this. We have one hectare of land that will become a food forest. So it's pretty large. We'll be able to do a lot of work here. We're right on the edge of the village of Barichara, which has a population of about 7,000 people. So 
the entire food, the entire um, field park is six and a half hectares. So this is one of those hectares where this food forest is being put in place. Just wanted to show you that serpentine path that we've been digging now for about six months. This is a new project. And we work here two hours a day every day, just to have a daily routine of devotion. And so it never feels like work. We sort of come and hang out and play and it's accumulating. My daughter was climbing on a big pile of grass while you guys were all listening to us chat today. So that's all I wanted to share and just say thank you so much to everyone. It's really been lovely to participate in this conversation with all of you. And I invite anyone who wants to come visit us in Barichara, you can climb on the giant pile of grass that my daughter likes to play on or help us dig a pond or two. <laughs> and we'll all hang out. That's it for me. And now my battery's running dead, so I want to say thank you. Okay. And everyone has a wonderful evening wherever you are. And promote, lovely to see you as always. Yes. Thank you so much for your inspirational work and all the best, all the cheers and blessings. I give my blessings to everyone there. Cheers to everyone, Felipe and family and the two sisters and community and all that. <clears throat> so uh, all of you, thank you for uh, being with us, sharing your stories, sharing our stories. It's all about collecting of stories, which will create something deeper and more delicious.